Hello and welcome. My name is Volker Helsler. I work for Film Academy, where I'm in charge of research and development and also the technical director course. So today, in the first hour of the Film Academy presentation, we will see the technical directors of the fourth year. So uh, four presentations, uh, a total of, I think, 140 slides. That's uh, going to be packed, lots of information, different uh, aspects of productions at Film Academy, animation, VFX, interactive media, but also RTDs engage in their own research topics. So um, uh, I would like to bring to your attention that um, you can still apply for the courses starting in fall until May 15th. Here are some flyers with further information and um, I probably won't be around for questions uh, because I have to run to another event, but my colleague Simon Spielmann who also works with me in R&D. Uh, he will be here to answer your questions and, and take questions from the audience. So without further ado, let's welcome our technical directors. So hello everybody. Thank you for coming to our talk. I am Yurai Tomori and I am technical directing student at Film Academy. And originally I am from Slovakia, where I also did my VFX bachelor degree and I also studied animation and VFX in Falmouth. I am mainly interested in graphics programming, FX pipeline and some shading. And in this presentation I will talk about two projects I have been working on during the last year. The first one is about FX for Rata Tosker, which is a full CG animated short film. And the second topic is about my diploma project about fractals. So as I already mentioned, Rata Tosker is a full CG animation I was helping with. It is a film academy diploma movie and it was finished last month. It is going to be screened here at FMX, so make sure to watch it. And for that project, I did some procedural modeling and simulation and all of it in Houdini. So on the left, you can see a concept art I was given and on the right is finished shot from the movie. And as you can see, it consists of many repeating parts which resemble vegetable, romanesque or broccoli. So the model consists of many spheres arranged in a specific spiral it is a spiral where angle between two successive points is a golden angle, like on the left image. And this kind of arrangement is in botany also known as philotaxis. So I copied this spiral all over the sphere and I used point cloud representation for this model because renderers can usually render them as a sphere primitives. However, the full model had over 18 millions of points, which was a bit too much. So to reduce it, I called invisible parts which have the amount of the particles or the points. My next task was to simulate this pile of fruits. So individual fruits are concave, so in order to have faster simulation, I approximated their original shape with spheres and I simulated them with bullet solver and bullet solver can work with compound spheres and is much faster than with concave shapes. And I exported back as an alembic with the same hierarchy just with updated shape transformations. My another task was to simulate those liana. The fastest approach was to skin them uh, to an animated fruit cache and I used point deform soap to transfer animation on them and this worked pretty well, but it did not preserve height of Liana. It stretched it in certain areas. So to fix that, I used a virus solver on top of that. And virus solver assured that there is no stretching going on while keeping the overall animation of Liana. And on the right bottom, you can see comparison of original skin deformation in red and the fixed one in green color. And I also helped with this shot. Big leaves are not simulated, but hand animated with a bunch of blends with some noise on top of it. And Liana in this case are simulated with grain solver. However, during working on the simulation, I often encountered a lot of stretching of the Liana. 
the constraints did not manage to preserve the original length. They also felt very soft. So to compensate for that, I created additional constraints with a neighboring point, and this worked pretty well. So now I will continue to the uh, second part of my presentation, and I will show you my diploma project, VFX Fractal Toolkit, and it is currently work in progress. It is going to be a set of tools for easy generation of fractals, which work well in a visual effects pipeline. It is based on an idea of ray marching isosurfaces of fractal functions, and I am preparing it for Strands of Mind diploma movie, which I will talk about in the following slides. And I am, I am implementing it in Houdini, in OpenCL, and Python. And after I will finish my studies, I will also release it as an open source project. So VFX Fractal Toolkit is developed for Strands of Mind movie, and I am technical director for this project. It is directed by Adrian Mayer and will be released next year. And it, this movie is a VR a music video full of fractal and abstract forms. And my tool will be tested and developed along the production of this project. And before talking too much about the VFX Fractal Toolkit, I will show you a short demo of its current state. So here you can see user interaction with the tool from, from Houdini. And in the network editor, on top you can see different nodes re which represent different fractal functions. And the bottom node is uh, basically rendering them. And here I'm trying to dive deep into them to see how much of detail are there. Also, as you can see, they are being rendered in screen space. So only what is visible is computed. And I also get a lot of shading and color information which can be used for artistic shading and art, art direction. Here I'll, I also show that each of those fractal functions, they can have a Julia mode where I can specify a Julia coordinate and it will create a new shape which, which has different shapes and it depends on the Julia coordinate. So that means that I have a lot of variety of possible shapes that I can produce with this tool. And also many of the fractals, they have like additional parameters which can be modified or even animated. And another feature I will show is that I can also combine multiple fractals, which brings like another dimension of variety of fractals it can produce. It depends on the order of the incoming fractals, and this way I can create new hybrid fractals with which inherit features of all its sources. So there are there are really a lot of possibilities, and I can also mix up the normal fractals and uh, Julia modes of fractals. So my inspiration for this project came from the following resources. As you may have noticed, a lot of recent movies used some form of uh, fractal art, and those techniques are also well documented in uh, listed articles. And apart from the movies, there are also a couple of applications that can render fractals, and there is very nice and helpful community of people behind them. Now I will try to briefly explain my approach so fractals can have a function which estimates a closest distance to its surface at arbitrary point in space. Let's call it the distance estimate or DE function. Some of the, uh, the DE functions are analytical, which means they are fast to calculate, while others do not have an accurate DE function, which means we need to approximate it numerically by taking more samples. So ray marching loop consists of the following steps send the ray from camera origin going through a corresponding pixel in image plane and sample the E function and move along the ray by the estimated distance. And this estimated distance is a safe distance which guarantees that we will not intersect the surface and repeat this until the D is smaller than a certain threshold which means we are close to the surface or until we reach maximum amount of steps. 
and that surface heat calculates normal vector and color inform information for shading. Colors are following fractal structure and are based on orbit traps technique. And at this point, we can also relatively cheaply compute ambient occlusion, which can be used for better viewport visualization. So what are my goals? Fractal generation can be a slow process, so I would like to make it as fast as possible. To do so, I use OpenCL for calculation on a GPU. I use Python for user interaction and scene assembly. I also try to minimize kernel recompilations. For example, when user changes a parameter, the code does not need to change. I'm also trying to optimize the rematching process to have the least possible amount of samples. And also one significant feature is that I am generating them only in a camera frustum in a screen space or within a specified bounds. So only what is directly visible is computed. Also, I also want to make this tool flexible and powerful. I want to enable user to build almost arbitrary scenes with node-based workflow and to animate them. Node-based workflow has the advantage of intuitive and accurate visual representation of fractal logic. I'm also planning to extend fractal logic by adding nodes for loops, condition, and branching Boolean operations. The tool is, is outputting a number of color channels and normals which means that the generated fractals can be rendered by any renderer or even exported out to another DCC application for rendering. And I'm also planning to support to output, output formats, point clouds and VDB volumes. And I'm trying to make it easy and intuitive to use. So my aim is to describe fractal scenes only with nodes so that no coding would be required but possible if needed. And I'm also integrating it in a VFX DCC which makes it easy for familiar artists to use my tool and use it in a visual effects pipeline. So here I show colored channels that I calculate at surface intersection from orbit traps. They result in interesting patterns which are following structure of fractal mostly. Main feature of my tool is that it is possible to generate infinite shapes of fractals. In the image on the left you can see a power 2 Mandelbulb fractal and on the right, it's Julia sets for two different coordinates. So by changing Julia coordinate, we can have, we can change its shape. Another way to create new fractal shapes is to combine multiple of them, create the so-called hybrids. Hybrids inherit features from its source fractals and depend on their order. They can be made of regular and Julia fractals. Here you can see another example. And as you can see, the tool also supports basic primitive shapes because those fractals are represented by distance values. I can use uh, SDF Boolean logic to combine them to do in union, intersection, or subtraction. Here is an example of sphere subtracted from, from union of Sierpinski and power to Mandelbulb. And because I am rendering them in screen space, some features are cheap, for example, space uh, repetition. And here we can see lonely Sierpinski, or not that alone, definitely not. So. This is end of my presentation. Thank you for your attention and make sure to check my, check my blog where you will find out more about my interests and get in touch if you have any questions, either by catching me after the talk or showing me an email. Thank you. Hello, um, my name is Lukas Kotkowski and um, I'm going to show you today the current state of my diploma project, which is the post-draw tool. Afterwards, I will talk a bit about the pipeline we developed for DreamMakers, which is a, on the one hand animation project and on the other hand a game. And afterwards, I will talk about the Scarif pipeline tools, which I'm developing together with Tim here. Um, but first, some words about me. Um, so how did I end up at Film Academy? Uh, I started to do my um, bachelor um, in Darmstadt at uh, University of Applied Science in Animation and Game. And afterwards, I worked for about two years at Pixelmondo as an effect city, um, where I mainly babysitted some dragons. Um, I would say my main interests are pipeline and effects, but I also really enjoy any kind of real-time projects, whether it be VR, AR, or whatever. 
So that was the reason for me why Film Academy is a good place to develop further in this direction. Whoops. So um, let me quickly tell you what my diploma project is about. So it's called PostDraw Tool. It's a Maya plugin to pose a complex 3D character using basic 2D strokes. Um, this offers a more uh, intuitive workflow for posing and staging your characters, especially in early animatic stages and blocking for your animation. Um, it might also be a convenient way for uh, interactive review sessions with you and the director where he might directly draw on top of your character to correct the pose and the action line. Um, the original paper is called Sketch to Pose and was presented 2015 by Pixar at SIGGRAPH. So now I show you the prototype of the current stage of the development. Um, this is in Maya, the viewport, and I'm in the, in the tool right now. So you see as I'm hovering over the character, I get highlights where my possible posable parts of the characters are. And I can also switch between different projection modes. So world space or object space or camera space. And then I can simply start to draw some lines and my character will align accordingly. So I can give him some fancy poses and work quickly. Um, you can also um, lock the parts where you want to pose. So first select start point and end point. And it's um, especially suitable for characters with tentacles, where you usually had lots of controllers and it would take you some time to get nice poses. And it's now just a matter of painting the right stroke. So um, what's happening under the hood? Um, the user can do some selecting by just coming close to the posable objects. And then he draws a 2D stroke in OpenGL. This stroke is then projected from 2D to 3D using one of the four spaces, either world, object, camera, or root space. Um, the stroke is then converted into a curve, and I extract some features of this curve to use them for the final pose matching process. Um, so there are two different types of pose matching. Um, the first one, which I just demonstrated, is post tracking, where you um, match each position of your posable parts of your character to an exact position of the curve. Um, and the other method is shape tracking, where you may match the shape of the stroke for each segment of your character. So you might end up not perfectly aligned at the curve, but the shape of the curve is exactly preserved. Um, how is the implementation done? It's a Python plugin for Maya. I'm writing my own um, MPX context for it and the drawing is done in Qt um, with an overlay for the viewport. Um, to use the tool, the rig needs to have small preparations done. Um, you need to reassemble sort of the hierarchical control structure for your controller objects, so the tool knows which controllers of your rig um, is in which hierarchy. Then you can come in and do some weighting, how, like which parts of the character should be depicted by the stroke, which are like closed segments. And then you have the possibility to mark which of those uh, posable parts are IK and which are FK, so the tool knows whether it's allowed to also alter the translation or just work on the rotation. Okay, next is DreamMakers, um, which I already mentioned is an uh, animation on the one hand and um, a game project on the other, actually a v cooperative VR game. Um, for, this to, for this project to realize, um, we developed some small tool, pipeline tools, uh, Tim and me together again, um, to help with that so that the assets can be used between trailer and game in the same way. And apart from working on the pipeline, I was also responsible for some of the effects work and the game programming and the real-time light and shading. So just some words about how the pipeline was working or was structured. So we used Maya, Houdini, Nuke, and Unity mainly. And Maya was mainly used for outputting geometry and animation, which was pushed to Unity and Houdini. Uh, for Houdini, we did rendering and effects, which was then, of course, done compositing in Nuke. But also, some parts of the effects and rendering were used to enhance some of the graphics inside Unity. 
and in the end we ended up with three different outputs, a trailer, a VR game, and a tablet version of the game. I will quickly show you some of the tools we developed. So there was a basic saver loader for scene selection, task management, and initial project setup. Um, the interface looks the same for all the different DCC applications, so the workflow for the artist doesn't change at all. Um, we had some content manager for referencing and managing versions of your assets inside your scene and a publisher which creates your export cache and do some cleanup work before the asset gets published. And we also shipped this thing with a standalone project browser where you can access all sorts of project related data like your play blasts, renderings, scene files and publishes. So this is just a quick impression of the final look for the VR scene where the player later stands in the middle of this laboratory and mixes different stuff together to create fancy dreams. And these are two pictures for the same assets used in the trailer. And here are the same assets on the tablet. Um, our small tool set was also used by some other Film Academy project. Also, for example, this year's FMX trailer, which you can watch here. Um, this great demand in pipeline tools um, encouraged Tim and me to go further into this direction. So we started to develop a new pipeline system completely from scratch with all the lessons learned in mind. So this new pipeline toolset we call Scarif and it's an artist friendly, easy to use toolset which supports very flexible workflows and structures and is suited for pretty much all sorts of CG projects whether, whether it be in VFX animation or a game engine project. Um, in the next couple of slides, I want to show you some of the main features. So some facts first, um, we support the usual softwares like Maya, Houdini, Nuke, and Unity for ha handling um, scene content, asset assembly, previewing, versioning, and dependency tracking. And the backbone of this whole pipeline is a MySQL database, and the system runs on Linux, Windows, and Mac. So. One of the core features we kept in mind was the full, full, asset, tr full asset dependency tracking. Um, so usually when you work on a CG project, you divide your tasks, you work into different tasks. You might start with modeling. From there, you go to rigging and shading. Animators break your rigs. And then lighters come in. Comp makes everything blurry again. And effects blows up your stuff. And the bigger the project goes, the bigger the mess. And in the end, you know not anymore where your final asset was used or not in the comp and if your director comes and say, oh hey, do we actually have the final version in comp of shot three or whatever, then you have to manually open all the different files and figure out if it was used or not. So with the full asset dependency tracking, this information is in the database stored, all the versioning info, all the tools have their content management tools, so the content is always trackable and you don't even have to touch Maya or any other software to figure out if your assets are up to date. Um, quick notice about the workflow, so artists have their work files and generate published data as usual. Um, important for us was that the published data contains an asset node and the published data then is available for all the other departments and this process of publishing is extensible and customizable so other pipeline TDs can hook in and write their own scripts to do some special treatment and the whole process and the whole system does not rely on any naming conventions. So. What's the asset node and why do you want to have it in your pipeline? Um, imagine you have your beautiful unicorn asset here in green. You have a model for it and a rig, and then you start animating and put some other rigs into your shot. Then you end up maybe with four rigs in one scene. Then you go to CFX, where you import your sim rig and the simulation rigs for all the other creatures. And when that's done, all your caches get exported to lighting, where you import or reference uh, your shading networks and the shading networks of all your other tasks. And then, well, for two characters, you can manually, manually assign it. But if you have hundreds, then you don't want to do this. And the asset node is there for automatic identification of everything. So it exists in the tr as a transform mode in the published file, whether it's a Lambic or a Maya file or Houdini file. 
So how is the asset node structured? Um, it's hierarchical. So at the very top, there sits the asset node. It has some metadata stored, like the unique ID, task type, some version info. And under the asset node comes the actual scene content. An example, the scene content, for example, if you have a rig, then you have the published rig with the asset node, the metadata, and underneath the character rig. And the character rig itself can contain some other published asset, for example, the character model, which has its own asset node then. So um, that's mostly from my side. So I talked to you about the database, the dependency tracking, some workflows, the asset node. And later, Tim will show you some more awesome pipeline stuff. But for now, thank you for your attention. And uh, don't forget to check out the ITFS trailers. Now, time for Tim. All right, thank you, Lucas. Uh, so we are halfway through. I hope you guys are up for some more techie talk. Um, I'm Tim. Uh, I'm also a technical directing student, of course, for fear. And I'm going to be talking about the Behind the Beard AR game, which you can play right now, um, the Scarif pipeline tools again, and my own diploma project, which is a post base recaching tool. Uh, to start off, I'm going to tell a bit about me. Um, so before I came to Film Academy, I was studying media computer science at Technische Hochschule Mittelhessen in Friedberg. So um, I was al always very passionate about the art of animation. So for my bachelor thesis, I was focusing on doing something for it. So I developed a universal data streaming solution for Motion Builder, which got me really interested in pipeline and tool development. So um, I ended up here. All right. So um, Lucas already talked. Oh, sorry, I skipped the slide. I'm sorry. <laughs> Behind the beard first. Um, does the video play, by the way? No. It does not. Oh, okay. Oh, perfect. All right, so Behind the Beard, uh, you might have already seen some trailers of it. So this is uh, the story of Bruno and Ben, the hipster. So Bruno is the beaver. And uh, in the play, so this is a combined project. We produced a couple of trailers and also this game. Um, you're basically um, focusing on the hipster. You're going to be the hipster yourself and um, use, the, uh, use Bruno the beaver to shave your own beard. And in the end, you will get a photograph. Uh, you can take that with your home. And everything is uh, utilizing face tracking. So you're controlling Bruno with your face. And for this, I did pipeline and uh, game development. And uh, I would be very happy if you guys were to check it out. It's uh, on the first floor. You cannot miss it. It's next to the Animation Institute booth. So now to Scarif. Um, Lucas already talked about the workflows and uh, how we manage dependency tracking. So I'm going to focus a bit on structures and what kind of tools we want to provide for the artists. Um, one of the key features we uh, implement is the decentralized asset workflow. So at Film Academy, we often have the project that people are working with you who are not inside uh, your team and more like external team members, which help out with tasks we cannot handle internally. So you are struggling with how to manage the files, like how can external people work with the stuff that's uh, on your server and how do you merge stuff. So with Scarif, we try to um, take that worry out of the hands of the artist and uh, manage everything with the tools. So Scarif is basically able to uh, offer the users different locations to access data, such as the server or maybe an external hard drive, which some uh, freelance artists might use. Uh, and you can copy assets between locations and, of course, have everything um, on the server so you can render it in the, in the end. Um, how is the pipeline itself structured? So how do we manage the, the code? Because it's, it's a quite big project, actually. And um, it's comprised of four modules, so we split it into four parts. Um, the first part would be the applications, which are uh, artist tools like the stuff um, Lucas showed, like this saver loader and all this kind of stuff. Um, we also have in the new version. 
but also the DCC integration and um, stuff like that is in the uh, applications package, which is itself comprised out of uh, the core, which contains all the necessary functionality like where is the asset, um, environment management, everything that is kind of the back end uh, is in there. And then there is the database, um, which contains, uh, of course, the database structure, how to connect to the database, etc. cetera. Um, the final module would be the hub, which is kind of the entry point for the artist, so it's always running uh, in the background on your machine, and you can um, use it to access the different tools or the different applications you need for your work. A small example on how this will be used in the production. So it can, be, it can get quite flexible because different projects with this workflow can use different versions. So uh, project A, maybe the Beaver, might have a different uh, version of all the packages than, uh, let's say, uh, the DreamLab project. But you can still run it on your machine and it's all accessible through the same hub application. So it's all very flexible and um, artists can work locally with different versions if they need it. Let's say there is, has been a hotfix for the rigor or something, and you can also integrate custom scripts very easily um, this way. Um, what was also very important to us um, is the artist-friendly setup or the artist-friendly loose in general. Um, there are quite a lot of pipeline scripts uh, flying around the internet and at Film Academy, but most of them are not really very friendly to set up, so you have to dig through files and kind of um, change stuff in the editor, which artists might not like. So we try to go a different way and make everything very guided. And um, even for the initial setup, you have an assistant which will guide you through everything. So it should be very easy, even without a TD at hand. Um, once you set up your stuff, uh, there are also a lot of management tools, so you can keep on uh, managing your stuff, um, which would be, for example, the user manager, where you can create new users, uh, check their credentials, add them to groups. Um, you can also manage the asset locations, which is um, going back to the point I was just talking about with the decentralized assets. So you can add another server, for example, or add another hard drive and set their priorities. So um, the artist will access the right um, location at the right time. Uh, another thing we already have done is um, the uh, app environment setup. So we already have a tool where you can basically specify different versions of different tools and you can also give them different environments. So for example, Rigger might need some other plugins. So just for the Rigger, we will load, let's say, Yeti for fur and um, this kind of stuff. So um, what do we actually want to do? Um, so we basically have finished all the backend stuff. Um, we started um, last year, at the end of last year, programming and uh, have finished all the backend and now focus on the actual tools. So we will have all the basic stuff, um, which Lucas already showed in the old pipeline, like save and load, scene assembly, etc. But we also want to do some more advanced tools, which are more fun. So let's say um, a material assembler, which will uh, take a certain set of textures and create a material for you based on the naming of the textures. Or um, what we did not have in the old pipeline, for example, was uh, batch processing, so we can publish multiple files in the background and make the whole workflow just faster. Um, a request we also got was a kind of cleanup tool because uh, often projects run out of space and as you might know, like rate space is very expensive. So you would like to know which stuff you actually use right now in the shot and which stuff might be obsolete. So you can move them on some less secure drive, which is less costly. Um, we can do that with the full asset dependency tracking Lucas was talking about. So this could be a quite uh, handy tool. Um, at some point, we also want to have some kind of uh, tiny shotgun in there. So there should be a producer view where you can basis, basically set up the shot, um, add assets and time ranges and this kind of stuff. So the artist only has to press a button to start working without needing to put um, the shot together themselves. Alrighty, so that was it for Scarif. 
Um, you might have noticed that this thing is uh, named after the Star Wars data planet. So this is kind of a thing I like to do. So my next project, my diploma project, is also named after a Star Wars uh, thing, the hyperdrive. Um, it's based on a Disney uh, animation talk at SIGGRAPH 2015, and it's all about achieving real-time playback with um, production rigs. So uh, it's a post-based rig caching tool in Maya, and uh, it's about minimizing rig evaluation. So why do you need that stuff? So here we can see uh, a very complex rig by my fellow TD Lisa Schachner, who is sitting right in front of me. And uh, rigs nowadays can get very complex and have a lot of nodes. So you have quite some heavy deformers and everything gets quite um, tricky and slow when you are animating. And every animator will tell you that animating without real-time feedback is a real pain in the butt. So um, traditional previews like Play blasts are kind of used to get that real-time feedback to check the motion, check, like, do I get the motion right? Do I have the right timing? Um, but they are quite inconvenient since you cannot tumble around the camera. Um, and if you want to change anything, you have to redo the whole play blast, so not very cool. Um, another thing would be the vertex catch, which is also integrated in um, Maya, but it's quite inefficient since it's doing the caching every frame. And once you change something, it has to be re-evaluated. And both methods also have to uh, rely on a complete evaluation on every single frame, which is um, what the new approach uh, proposed by Disney, the post-based approach, is trying to solve. So what is this actually? It's still kind of a vertex caching, but a bit smarter. So instead uh, of caching per frame, you're caching per pose. So you're detecting a character pose, and whenever that pose is showing up on the screen, you will basically get the cache instead of calculating the deformation. Um, this is quite handy, so you can still tumble around the camera, it's still interactive, and you can still reuse old caches for poses that might not be currently in use for later on because they will stay valid. So if some other animator or you uh, still get that pose at some time in the future, it is still cached and it will uh, evaluate very fast. So how do we do this? Um, first things, we need to calculate the pose. To do this, we combine all the rig controller values like rotation and translation uh, into a unique ID that is also um, having a rig tag, so it's also encoding the version, so if things change, also the, the pose ID will be changing. And this requires some setup by the rigging department, so the rigger needs to define all these attributes um, I put in there, are kind of defining my character pose. Um, once we have the pose, we can kind of check. So we check if uh, in our cache is there this pose, do we have already a mesh for this pose? Uh, if we have a mesh for this pose, we can completely disable evaluation, thereby save a lot of computational time and retrieve the cached mesh. If we do not have the pose, we have to run the full evaluation, just like you would do uh, uh, without caching, and store the cached mesh for later use. So the next run uh, of this same pose will be much faster. Um, how does this work? So what are kind of the kind of the advantages. So um, when the animation changes, there is the big advantage here. Um, for example, you have cached your uh, whole timeline completely, and you do some changes in a couple of uh, places, and they affect certain ranges uh, I masked here with uh, yellow. Uh, in a time-based approach, you would have to invalidate that old cache. So from the first frame on, you would have to recache everything. That is not very cool, and also, um, takes a lot of time and uh, yeah, it, things can, can get better. So um, with the post base approach, you are basically detecting, aha, uh -huh, this character post I do not have yet. So you're not discarding your old cache, you're just recalculating a new one and maybe keep the old one for later. So if the animator reverts this change, you can still use it and he doesn't have to cache at all. It's still there. So this is very handy and it might also be um, of use when there are loops, because loops are reoccurring poses, and so you only have to cache a certain frame range and can play a lot of um, loops of the same animation. 
Uh, here's the current state of my uh, diploma project. So this is my current node prototype. It's uh, working with a single mesh and it gives you about four to five times the frame rate increase. So here we are caching all the poses. So none of the poses have been cached. And once that has run through, you will get a lot of better um, playback. So now you can have that sweet 24 FPS every, every animator wants and um, they will be much happier. And um, the current state, so I'm implementing this as a C++ node for Maya, and it's currently working with in-memory cache only. But um, I also plan to support file and network at some point, so I can save out the cache for later or share it with another animator, let's say. And also background caching would be really cool, so I get more Maya instances running and they cache different frame ranges so that the, fro uh, the foreground uh, Maya application gets the caches much faster. Um, as you can see, the, the plugin itself still needs a lot of optimization, so this is where I'm currently focusing on, and uh, after I'm done, I will hopefully also be publishing this for you guys. So this was it from me. Uh, thanks for your attention, and I wish you a great time at FMX. So if you have any questions, uh, keep them for later. Um, I will be around, and I will hand it to Arash. So hey everyone, my name is Arash and uh, I will talk about three different projects with you. The first one is Sparity, uh, which is an interactive VR experience. The second topic is machine learning for CG on for fixed pipelines. The last one is my own diploma project, which is about a virtual assistant through machine learning. Let's start with Sparity, the interactive short film. Spirit is an interactive VR experience in which you get the chance to pilot the space shuttle to the International Space Station. Uh, our goal was to provide a space flight experience for everyone. Our personal ambition for the project was to be as close to the real docking procedure as possible. Uh, we put a lot of time and effort into making sure that everything from the buttons and the dashboard in front of you to the communication with ground uh, back on Earth was a great to reality. And during the project, I was allowed to join the team and was responsible for the pipeline, especially in regards to unique combination of traditional VFX elements into a real-time game engine. So if you want to know more about the project or try it out, uh, forward to Tom Allen and you can take a flight to ISS. I also become really invested in machine learning and how it can be applied to for fixed pipeline using open source libraries such as uh, im 2 dex pix to pix or even face swap. The first instance where I applied this approach was for capturing images, uh, image sequence in Nuke Studio. So instead of searching your sequence, by hand and looking for the right sequence, you can type your search term and get the output. Here you can see the current pipeline, this is prototype. Uh, you, you have your sequence, it will go through the inception v3 from Google. And if it's cached once, uh, it's in your database and you can use the implementation as you can use a neto language toolkit to get the semantic similarity and refines the search results so you are sending your sequence and then searching for the right image the goal here was to make it much easier to search tag sort or generate metadata for large amount of images here see example, so the co it's more a combination as object detection and natural language processing. And this approach can be used in multitude of applications such as Unity, for example, or even as an instant alone application. Here we are using the webcam image and doing the inference and 
this uh, input. So it's there are some limitations, but another way that machine learning can be used is in using a minimal amount of data to generate a synthetic high definition output. I use an alpha channel for explosion paired with a beauty render of the same frame as an input. So if you have your first render from your production, you can already tra start to training your model and from that moment you can create really cheap uh, your output. The training model is able to output a full diffuse texture for every frame of the explosion based on the training, all within the constraints of that black and white alpha. Let's have a closer look to the training set. In this case, there are 40 frames of pairs. It's also possible to, uh, to use a really low scale alpha to upscale that and feed that to the agent. So here are some outputs and uh, how you can see the outlines are strong based on the input alpha. The style and the look comes heavily from the training in unit. So the ground true is here the something between the outlines from your source and the training style. The key point here is that you can train different models for different style and having trained them once, you can then generate unlimited versions of that style of explosion very cost effectively. The next challenge was the digital actual project, where the goal was to create digital doubles of historical personalities on a small budget and a short production cycle. I took some shots, uh, shots that had not been selected uh, for the final film to evaluate uh, our machine learning workflow. The first approach was to, f uh, to create a final beauty from our actual raw image, so feeding the model with your footage from from the shot. Also here, let's have a closer look to the data set. On the left side, you will see our actor face, and the right side, uh, you can see the random generated images from random positions with the face of center of interest, also different poses to give the model such of variations of different uh, perspectives. And based on this, uh, but based on this workflow, we, are, we lose all, uh, a lot of advantages and preference of the comp, uh, comp department. So we don't really need the comp department because we get already the final beauty. And it's also, also already tracked on the face. So I decided to use other workflow and here we are using the active footage as input for different model training for diffuse specular reflection passes since we use different model for each of these models we were able to pass the individual output directly to the comp department and use them directly without having having to modify their pipeline so now we are embedding the comp department into this workflow and we are keeping all the benefits of machine learning and compositing. And also here, like, let's take a look. So instead of the final beauty on the right side, you will see always the pass. So now we are training the actor on the right pass. And then you can, after the training session, different departments are able to request the right pass base and checkpoint on the input image. Let's also here take a closer look. So that's our input the image on the left side. In the middle are the three outputs from the network and combine these two into Nuke and using classic Nuke workflows, we will get something like this. So on the 
right side, you will see the ML render, the, so the final beauty which is created uh, through the model. In the middle, you see the multi-pass render workflow, and if you look, if you would spend time and look in closer to eyebrows or at the this hard edge on the left side of uh, of the middle image on the face. So we have more, more uh, much more freedom to modify the output on the top. So as last topic, I will go through my own diploma project, which is about uh, virtual assistants. For that, I am working on the implementation of the paper sequence to sequence learning with neural networks, which describes the use of variant of long short term memory technique to reproduce the result of a neural conversational model which describes the assignment of complicated structure to other compli complicated structure. And here in this case, we are assigning a sequence to other sequence. And if you are interested in the topic, these two papers are the source uh, which you should start with. As platform, I am using Google's TensorFlow and the NMT library, so the Neural Machine Translate. I, I choose this board because it has the best guidance and performance to build a sequence-to-sequence -sequence model from scratch. The goal for the agent is not to create uh, is is not to create only an agent which is able to carry on general conversation like simple or general knowledge Q&A, but that is also able to contribute to the solution by sending actual API calls directly to Maya. The advantage of such a system is that you can point to the solution directly in the user software rather than the long way to presenting instruction which user then has to follow themselves. And embeddings are maybe the most important topics uh, in this case. Uh, we are using embedding to train the model, and they are built on each other, going from very general, uh, general such as movie subtitles to very specific, such as parts of the entire Autodesk forum. You see in the upper part the corpus contribution. So we have different corpus. We have Kernel, open uh, movie subtitle library, we have Reddit, and then we have knowledge and other corpus. The order and the contributions are really important for the for your output. So it's not a good idea to to feed the Reddit corpus as a last part. Here are some examples, so you can be, uh, we have always a question and answer. There is more the core embedding uh, of the agent. As a second, we have the assistant layer, where you, ha you have also handling unknown input from the user, but also to give the assistant something like a personality. So to handling question like, what's, a f what's first aid? Which is the name of the plugin? But if you want to do more than conversation and need more specific feedback, this has to be computed first. For example, there is a big difference between the question which colors the sky and what time is it or what is two plus two. The, for the first question, we know everybody knows the answer. But for the second, for this kind of question, it should be something should we calculate first. Here, uh, the AI need to understand the user as well the specific input parameter, including in the sense. So that's the intent. So you can apply the agent tasks and not only uh, taking conversation with him. And how you can see, we can train the agent with the function name in the data set. So you, you can also uh, use an example, I use the uh, Maya, a short Maya corpus to show you the current stage of the, of the uh, diploma project. 
So how you can see, I will start with general conversation and you, s you will also see raw in output from the agent. So it's giving me the function name, which should be called if the user asking this question. Now I am going directly to Maya. So you can hide your your whole logic behind this intent functionality. You can build your decision tree behind this uh, intent, and you are guiding the user through a path. So As next, uh, I will wrap the intents into functions. That was only a prototype to bring you the concept. Adding uh, Maya specific embeddings. So going through the Maya forum and web scraping the conversation. And also topics like speech to text or text to speech are also open in the next time. Thank you for your attention, and I will forward to Simon. Well, one hour of pure nerdness here, so <laughs> thank you guys, and are there any questions? Uh, hi, I have a question for the post matching. Um, so because of a uh, high dimensionality, you have like a ton of controls and each one has like at least three channels or whatever. Um, so if a post is that specific, you will probably never hit it again. So I assume there's an RBF solver or something like that, uh, solver behind. Uh, but with that, you have some kind of uh, surrounding, right? So the post will never actually match what the animator has actually animated. So I'm trying to understand uh, the actual post matching. I didn't read the paper from uh, Pixar. Uh. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a good question. It's probably the, the thing I always uh, get asked. So, um, what what Disney is doing? They are y usually have a little threshold. So, um, not not exactly every value change. If it's really really small, will result in a um, in a new post. So you have this because the floating points are. Uh, will fluctuate in Maya, so do you might get rounding errors and you will actually never hit the same post, that's correct. So you have to kind of uh, multiply it with a fixed factor to um, compensate that. And um, for the, the solving, I, I think I did not really get uh, what you were into uh, with that question, but um, for example, for loops, you will of course always get the same um, post because you always get the same values. And um, the, I think it's less important that you always have a very small amount of poses, but that you can actually reuse the pose. So if you have, for example, load the animation in a different file, um, for example, for a crowd scene maybe, and you have a couple of rigs in there, you don't need to use the cache because um, the rig can still be in there and you can just check the poses and load the cache instead. Um, yeah, uh, does this kind of ask, uh, answer your question, hopefully? Uh, i ask you later a little more. Okay, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> One really quick question. Um, is there any way we can take a closer look at Scarif? Uh -huh. <laughs> That's a good one. Uh, I, right now, not really, um, when? because we, yeah, when? Next year, next year, of course. Oh. Um, so we plan on doing, hopefully, uh, another talk about it next year, because um, we will be using it in a couple of diploma projects, so we're currently at the right at the threshold where we kind of have all the back end, which is not really fun to show, that's why it was not in there, and more kind of the general explanation but there will be something. So hopefully next year or 
Yeah. Yeah, hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, another question. Um, I have a quick question about the drawing the pose. Um, and it's like you said uh, that the rigger need to prepare uh, something to, uh, to to make it work. So what's what's the idea? What the rigger needs to do? That is it about controls or was it, what what he has said like to prepare? Thanks, Alex, for joining. Um, <laughs> well, actually, it's pretty easy. You just have your animation controls, like usual in Maya. You have like curve controls, and you just drag them from your outliner into my sort of hierarchical outliner and represent the hierarchy because, for example, in FK, maybe your controllers are already hierarchical ordered, so um, the node itself knows, okay, um, the, for example, elbow controller knows my parent is the shoulder controller, but in IK, for example, well, you cannot, you have sort of a broken hierarchy in the case that um, your IK controller is probably not the child of your shoulder controller and things like this, so you just have to sort of create a logical hierarchy for the plugin so it knows, okay, here there's the hip and afterwards comes the chest and the spine and the neck and from there it branches maybe off to the two shoulders and so it's really just drag and drop. Okay, so let's thank again our uh, technical directors here and then...